Okay, now, microbes, and I also like to go, go into this at the beginning because this is a microbiology course. I am a microbiologist, so what is it exactly that microbiologists study? We study microbes, okay? And there are five different classes of microbes. And I'll generally put them here uh, arranged from size, from the largest to the smallest. Algae, fungi, protozoa, bacteria, and viruses. Okay. And many of these we're familiar with just in our daily lives. The algae, uh, so these are really the largest of the microbes, they can form these huge colonies that are quite visible to our eyes. As a general rule, microbes are too small to be seen with the unaided human eye. So microbiologists study things where you need a microscope or a magnifying glass or something to magnify what you're looking at. So as a general rule, microbes are too small to be seen with the unaided human eye. Okay? But algae and some fungi will come together and form colonies of cells that are visible. Okay? They, now put another bracket here, microbes also tend to be unicellular in that one cell makes up the entire organism. So they're not multicellular like an animal or a plant. They tend to be one cell makes up the entire organism. But the algae and some of the fungi can come together to form these colonies of organisms. And the largest that we know of, or that we're familiar with around here anyway, if you go down to PCH, actually if you just go to the Santa Monica Pier and look off, you'll see the, the kelp beds. Okay, that's the California kelp beds. That's a brown algae. It's the largest algae in the world. And if you go to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and, or even the, the Long Beach Aquarium, they have a smaller kelp tank there. You can actually see how big these kelp are from the bottom to the top. What you're seeing as you're driving down PCH are just the top fronds with the little bubbles that uh, give them a lot of exposure to the sunlight where their brown chlorophylls will pick up that energy for photosynthesis. So those are the largest of the microbes and readily observable. There are these colonies of algae. Most of them are a lot smaller than the green algae, which most of us will see if you look at a dirty swimming pool or a dirty aquarium. You see the green algae forming there, black algae. A lot of times they're classified based on their color. Very few algae are associated with infectious disease. It's very rare for an algae to make anybody sick. Sometimes they can produce toxins. And there are a group of algae that have a red color. And during certain times in the summer, when they grow up in, uh, in the uh, ocean environment along the surf, uh, you'll get the red tides. And those are red algae. You, can't not you don't notice it so much from the coast, but there was one time I flew out of LAX up north and went out and right over the Santa Monica Bay up towards Ventura. You could just see that red algae. It was a real bad summer for red algal blooms. And those red algae will sometimes produce toxins that are released into the water. So those toxins can make you sick. So they warn surfers and swimmers to avoid swimming uh, when the red algal blooms are present. Or sometimes the mollusks, uh, mussels and oysters and things like that, will feed off the algae and the toxins will build up inside of the mollusks. So I think on Santa Monica Pier and other piers around, uh, you see these little signs warning pregnant women not to eat mussels that are harvested out of Santa Monica Bay because the possibility, based on the time of the year, of toxins building up inside these uh, filter feeder uh, mollusks. But the algae themselves, don't cause, usually don't cause disease in humans. Okay. The fungi, these would be the molds and the yeasts. The molds are the colonial forms of fungi and the yeast tend to stay as single cells. So you'd need a microscope to see the yeast forms of fungi, but the ones that come together and form molds, these colonial growths, they're quite visible. Just looked at any moldy bread or moldy food, those are the aerial mycelia, and they're also growing down into the food themselves. 
Uh, some fungi are toxic, or, well, some fungi can cause disease, uh, usually not, it's rare in, in the United States, uh, but some, some real nasty infections can be caused of molds that grow up into your sinuses and get into your brain. Uh, really nasty stuff, but those are really quite rare here in the United States. Yeast infections are very common, especially in women with uh, vaginal tract infections, um, but they're, they're usually treatable. Uh, mushrooms are a form of a mold, and I read in the paper the other day that a family went out mushroom hunting a couple of days ago, and several of them are in intensive care from eating the toxic forms of mushrooms, so they'll need some liver transplants. But uh, So some fungi can be pretty nasty if they form toxins. Protozoa, these are like microbial animals. They're usually swimming in aqueous environments. Some of the really horrible tropical diseases are caused by protozoa. Uh, malaria is one, African sleeping sickness. And if you study parasitology, it scares the daylights out of you because some of these diseases are truly horrific. Protozoal infections are, are relatively rare here in the United States. And uh, I don't think... I can't think of any that have been weaponized or that could be used by terrorists, so we're not really going to talk much about protozoa in this particular class. Okay? But the bacteria and the viruses, okay, we'll be talking an awful lot about those. And notice this little bracket for unicellular doesn't come down and include the viruses. The viruses are acellular in structure. So they don't have a cellular structure to begin with, so they don't fall into the classification of the cellular basis of life. But we'll be talking a lot about viruses and a lot about bacteria.